Good morning, Oklahoma. I'm Curtis Hare and welcome to SUNUP. Recently, there have been reported cases of the Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus in Mexico. Now, there are no cases in Oklahoma, but horse owners do need to be prepared. For more, here's Oklahoma State University Extension Equine Specialist Chris Heine. So we essentially have three um, types of equine encephalitis, Eastern, Western, and Venezuelan. So typically when we're vaccinated horses and thinking about the presence of that disease, we always talk about Eastern and Western. Venezuelan is really only found in Central and South America. So it's not one that we typically are concerned about. However, recently there've been some reports of horses in Mexico with the Venezuelan equine encephalitis. Venezuelan does act a little bit differently than Eastern and Western encephalitis. So essentially Eastern and Western circulate within the bird and mosquito population, and then horses are a dead end host. And so we don't really get transmission from horse back to mosquito with Eastern and Western. Venezuelan, however, does cause high levels of viremia or viral load within horses, donkeys, and mules. So the difference with Venezuelan is that mosquitoes can actually pick up this virus from a horse and then transmit it on to other animals. So it does act a little bit different than Eastern and Western. The best prevention for all of our encephalitis is actually vaccination. So the standard one that we give, if, if we talk about vaccinations in horses, we talk about EWV. So the EWV is equal, our Eastern, Western, and Venezuelan. So we do have vaccines that are available to prevent this disease. We have not had any cases reported um, in Oklahoma, but what we want people to be aware of because of how this virus does act, because horses can bring it up with them. So if we have reported cases in Mexico, we have a fair amount of horse traffic between Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma. And so it's possible that horses that have been exposed to it um, in Mexico can travel north, bring the virus with them, and that's where the mosquitoes can then pick it up. Hi, Wes Lee, and welcome to the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. We have been just about as lucky as possible this summer at dodging the normally oppressive summer heat. As of midweek, we have had only a handful of sites that have seen the 100 degree mark, all of them being in the western third of the state. As nice as it has felt, it looks like the tide may finally be turning as a high pressure heat dome is expected to set up residence directly over the state this weekend. This map is the expected high temperatures for Saturday. You can see that most of the state will be at or above the normal highs of about 94. And according to the Climate Prediction Center, the heat dome is likely to persist for a while. This map shows the temperature expectations for next week. The browns and reds indicate it is likely to stay above the long-term average for this time of year. Two weeks out and the picture looks almost the same with a high probability of hot weather to deal with. The temperature is only one of the weather variables that can make Oklahoma summer so hard to deal with. With the increase in heat, we will likely see increases as well in relative humidity. These two together gives us the heat index. Heat indexes have not been a factor for a while, but the National Weather Service is indicating that they may move up into the warning levels starting this weekend. This is the heat index forecast from the Norman office for Saturday afternoon. The Tulsa office is showing numbers even higher for eastern counties. You can see how the heat index is calculated with this table. Technically, they can only happen when temperatures are 80 or above. As the temperature increases and or the humidity increases, then the number climbs higher. There is another calculated product that is even better at estimating how the heat might be impactful. It is the wet bulb globe temperature risk. This map takes into account multiple weather factors to determine a human felt temperature. Here is an example of the map from Wednesday afternoon. On this day, there were no real risk factors showing up, but we expect a lot of high and extreme risk to show up next week. 
This table does a good job at showing the difference between heat index and the wet bulb globe temperature risk. The latter takes into account more variables such as wind, sunlight intensity, and sun angle. It is also measured in direct sunlight and not in the shade like heat index is. If you have to be out in the heat in the coming few weeks, it is wise to know the symptoms of heat stress and heat stroke. While some of the signs may be similar between the two, one big difference is sweating. If you are experiencing heat symptoms and suddenly stop sweating, it is time to seek out medical attention as quickly as possible. Along with the heat will be limited rainfall. Gary will be back next week to catch us up on the latest rainfall and drought maps on the Oklahoma weather. Well, this cool, wet summer has been probably pretty nice for us, but Josh, how's this been for summer crops? It's actually been great. Uh, we have a couple of concerns with the, the coolness, um, specifically with how late we've had to plant a lot of our summer crops and how many you know growth days we still have left in the year. Unfortunately, we don't know when that growth season's gonna end, uh, but, but these, these good days, high 80s, uh, low 90s with good soil moisture underneath it are great for summer crops. And, and we can kind of look out on this bean crop and, and see that it's, it's done really well, uh, very low stress throughout, um, particularly with the corn crop, a lot of it started pollinating, starting to fill grain right whenever we started decreasing those temperatures from those 90s and 100s back into the 80s. That, that's done wonders for that crop. So we've got lots of good filling. Um, the beans are coming along, going through uh, our early season are starting to go through flower. Our, our double crop is a little bit bigger of an issues with some of those double crop, but, but bulk majority of the, the crop around the state's doing pretty good. You mentioned the double crops. You know, we had Brian on last week and he, he was mentioning some leaching issues in just summer crops in general, but, but a lot for the double crop. Um, so what are some issues that you're seeing with the double crops, summer crops? Well, the unfortunate thing, like a lot of the double crop is, is relying on wheat getting out. And we were late with our wheat getting out, so we were late with our beans going in. And a lot of folks uh, had, had beans going in right ahead of that last big rain we had. And, and when some of, those, some of those areas around the state were getting four, five, six inches at a time, uh, what, we, what we ended up with on the back end is where we had low-lying areas or areas where water collected a little bit. Our stands are really suboptimal. Um, some place where we have a little bit of slope and get the water off of the beans is, is doing okay, but we're starting to see the seed come out either malformed or have some disease to it, or sometimes growers are digging down and the seed is almost disintegrated, turned into mush in there. That has a lot to do with how much water was just kind of sitting on it when it was going through early germination into emergence. Unfortunately for us, some of our double crop, specifically our beans up in that north central area that got a lot of that last rain, that's, that's kind of what we've seen. Is there anything else that's you know on the top of mind of producers uh, out in the state that's you know either a concern or maybe something that's quite promising? Yeah, well, we, we've talked about it year in, year out. Because of all the rain we've had, weeds are an issue. And, and so we're getting to that point to where growers need to either pull the trigger on an application or it's kind of too late and you have to look at alternative options. The other thing we have growing through, going throughout the state is, is worm pressure. Um, uh, a lot of our Lepidoptera, specifically our army worms, are, are really starting to hit hot and heavy. But something like really young soybean can be an issue. It can also be an issue for some of our, our, like our grain sorghum that's gone to head because those army worms can get up in the head and eat a little bit. We're more concerned with corn ear worms in that regard than, than army worms, but army worms can be an issue. So it's adding a stress that we really just don't want because we have good conditions otherwise. So for those double crop systems that might have had an herbicide on them, you know, pre-plant herbicide, and then going into the summer with the double crops, um, are you seeing any weed pressure there? Yeah, we're, we're still seeing it. Uh, and, and it's because of all the rain that we've gotten in this late June, early July. Uh, and, and we see that even folks that have gone out and made these applications very systematically, very good. Um, in some of those systems, we're still seeing the weeds weeds come on. Go out and take a look, scout, make sure you don't need to go put, put something out over the top. Because like with something like soybean, once we get a flower kind of come up, a lot of our control options uh, go off the table. So if you can grab it before we get a flower out on some of the late planted beans, uh, that, that's something that, that growers will probably want to do. All righty, thanks, Josh. Josh Lofton, Cropping Systems Specialist here at Oklahoma State University.
We're out here today talking summer crops and the insects that are causing them problems. And Tom, what are you seeing across the state? Well, I'm hearing lots of different kind of things. In southeastern Oklahoma, fall army worms are moving up there and getting into pastures. And of course, anybody that wants to put up hay has to be aware that uh, fall army worms can come into a grass pasture and mow it down pretty quickly if they're not on top of uh, scouting. Um, in southwestern Oklahoma, um, some of my colleagues there have been scouting sorghum and they're starting to find headworms. And just the idea that fall armyworms are coming up this way, if you got la late planted sorghum, uh, I'm sure there's going to be producers um, that will see uh, world damage like what we might show here and get concerned about that. So we have some of those things to talk about, plus sugarcane aphid a little bit. We always have to be aware of that too. Right now we're out here in some sorghum and we see a little bit of bullet holing, things like yes, that. Uh, yes. What else is going on around Well, um, producers will come out here and see this kind of injury from fall, fall armyworms coming in. They get down in the whirl and they feed. And as the plants expand, they cause this what we call bullet holing or shot holing. And a lot of times it's not noticed until after there's some significant damage and they get concerned about it. And by that time, the fall armyworms are big they're fat, they're fully fed, and they're ready to turn into a pupa, so you're really not gonna get much damage. Uh, so the things that they need to think of before that, or after that, is that as it starts heading, you've got fall armyworms coming in in flights, you've got potentially corn earworms coming in, and the headworm complex is where uh, they need to be thinking about next and scouting for that. But this, this kind of weather is probably really conducive for fall armyworm survival and moving up and, and uh, coming up. So it's kind of, it's a little bit early for them right now, I would say, uh, that they're showing up. But uh, we also have to think about, uh, especially with late planted sorghum, uh, in this kind of weather, it might be conducive for, for sugarcane aphids to do pretty well, especially in susceptible variety sorghum. And with armyworms, what kind of thresholds should uh, producers have in mind? Um, well, for whirl corn, we don't really talk about it a whole lot. We have a set of thresholds uh, for headworm, but it, it's all dependent upon the cost of the application and what they think their crop is going to be worth in terms of yield. And it also depends on the distribution of the, the size of the caterpillars that are in the head. In, in grass pastures in e eastern Oklahoma where they want to put up some hay, our threshold is pretty simple. We, use it, we have a really complicated sampling system. It's called a wire <laughs> hanger that's pulled into a square. This covers about two-thirds of a square foot. You put it on the ground, you count whatever armyworms are in that square, one to two and that would be about uh, the threshold. If you had one to two within this area, that'd be about uh, two to three per square foot. And uh, you can make your decision to control at that point in time to make sure that you have a hay crop that you can put up uh, in the barn and use for later. And you've got some resources available to help some producers make these kinds of decisions. Yeah, we, we have some fact sheets that can give producers kind of a generic uh, threshold for um, headworms. But I'm also working uh, with a programmer to develop a smartphone app that uh, can take producers' information on what they think their crops work, what the yield potential is, how much it's going to cost to spray, that can all be combined into a system um, that they can go out and sample their field. All right, thank you, Tom. Dr. Tom Royer, Extension Entomologist for Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like more information on the things that he talked about today, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Backyard agriculture has become very popular in the last few years, and especially with COVID and people being at home, and backyard agriculture has really exploded. And so there's been a lot of calls uh, at the county level for things like backyard poultry and gardening and even honeybees. And so uh, AggieCon partnered with Entomology and we're starting to create the um, list of fact sheets starting off with the budget or how much it costs to get started on bees. We, we do really listen to what the public needs in terms 
terms of extension support. Um, so we hear from the county educators what people are looking for, um, areas that may be unique or different um, that need a little bit more support. And when we were hearing about beekeepers and you know not even knowing exactly what equipment to buy, so not even having a list of the equipment and the associated costs if they're trying to decide if they want to become a beekeeper, um, we didn't even have a fact sheet on that. And so we're really starting from the ground level and working on very much the basics, just enough to get people started and we'll keep building on those materials um, as we progress. Bees have a USDA designation of livestock. Um, people are, are a little bit confused about that, but we do eat honey. Um, they also create another product, uh, wax. So uh, here in Oklahoma, we actually have really good laws to protect beekeepers. Um, the law basically states that you can have bees um, and that includes in your neighborhood and things like that. I think that being a good neighbor is important, so making sure that if you do put a beehive in your backyard, that it's in a place that won't interfere with your neighbors, you make sure you let your neighbors know, and items like that. Um, there are costs associated with bees. So like you can see behind me, um, these boxes have frames in them. Um, there are other pieces of equipment that you just really need, like a bee suit. Um, but just to get started, ballpark range is between maybe say five and seven hundred dollars. And so there is a cost associated with that. Um, one of those costs can be purchasing the bees themselves. Um, so this is something that you can't just all of a sudden decide I'm going to have bees tomorrow. Um, typically there's a season for getting bees. Uh, most people put their orders in in January and then pick up their bees around this time of the year. Uh, so we, are, we already started with a budget for beekeepers uh, to begin with, and then we'll continue to build on that and how certain decisions that you make to manage your hive can impact your profits if you're selling honey. Although bees are a unique species for agriculture, um, we really need to think of them the same way that we think about cattle and other livestock and managing crops when it comes to decision making. Curly dock is, an, is a toxic plant that grows here in Oklahoma. There's actually quite a few different types of dock, but, this, but curly dock is the one that's most widely distributed across the state. Um, it's not acutely toxic to animals, so it doesn't kill them really quickly. They have to eat quite a bit of curly dock to actually have issues with toxicosis. Um, but the issues happen typically when you have animals that are turned into a pasture um, before many of our warm season grasses have started to grow. Other instances when you might have issues with curly dock are when you do a prescribed burn in a pasture and the areas along a creek or pond don't burn well. This plant typically grows in those types of habitat and if it doesn't burn up and it's one of the only plants that's still remaining after the fire, you can have animals that end up consuming it and quite a bit of it, enough that can really um, be a toxic issue for them. If they consume enough of this plant, it will kill cattle, sheep, and goats. You can identify curly dock by its growth form. So it has these long, narrow, really wavy leaves, as you can see here. Then when it flowers, it puts on these little winged seeds. And as they, as they mature, they turn this darker red color, as you can see behind me. At this time of year, we don't, midsummer, we typically don't have too many issues with animals consuming curly dock simply because there's so many other plants for them to choose from. If you're going to control this plant, the best time of year to do it is when it's small, early spring. Typically, you want to spray it with herbicide before it's six inches tall. 2,4-D and metsulfuron methyl are two really excellent, inexpensive herbicides that effectively control curly dock. A good thing to do at this time of year is note where you have this plant growing, so then next year you can go ahead and kill it when it's small. This plant is perennial, so in the winter it will die back to the ground, but it will regrow from that same plant. So you'll have the same plants growing back in the same location year after year. If you have questions of whether you have curly dock or not in your pasture, go ahead and take pictures of the plant and bring it into your county extension office so your county educator can help you to tell whether it is curly dock or not. Well, last week, our grain marketing specialist, Kim Anderson, broke down the latest news in the WASDE report. But Kim, looking past the WASDE, is there any other news that should concern producers? Well, I think what we've got to look at as we're going out in the long run is, is the production around the world. You know, the record world wheat production, the record corn production, the record soybean production. Production is increasing around the world. You've also got the value of the, of the U.S. dollar. It's up in the, in the 90s. Uh, you get the news media if it starts down that they say, well, we're, things are going to be more expensive. But over the long term, that dollar value is about 80, 82. 
and, and when it's up in the 90s, that prohibits and makes our exports more costly. Uh, you can look at what's going on in China. China is, is you know, they're just kind of like a, a gray box or a black box. You don't know what's coming out of there. You've got the Ukraine. They're implementing uh, some land reform that's going to impact production on down the roads. You've got Brazil. They, they continue to bring acres into production. You've got Romania and Pakistan exporting more wheat. And of course, India is changing their wheat marketing system that should improve the quality of that product. So specifically with wheat, um, what concerns you with that crop? Well, I think it's the production, the world production around the world. Let's look at uh, Ukraine and their, their land reform. They will be allowed to own 100 uh, hectares of land. That's about 247 acres. In uh, 2024, that'll go up to 1,000 hectares, which is uh, around 2,470 uh, hectares of land. Uh, that, you know, uh, farmers here that rent land, they're afraid to put money into it because they increase their productivity, and then somebody else rents it out from under them. Uh, Ukraine's saying if if we have farm ownership, these farmers will make this land more productive, and that's what the research says that will happen. Uh, you look at uh, the Ukraine there, you go back 10 years, they were producing uh, 579 million bushels of uh, wheat. It's 1.1 billion now, it can even go higher. Uh, so I think we need to watch Ukraine and what's going on with wheat production around the world. You know, shifting to corn, last week you were mentioning there have been some changes um, in the corn markets with the Wall Street Report. What's going on, what, you know, what's driving that change? Well, I think, again, it's production. And go to Ukraine with this land deal. 10 years ago, they produced 824 million bushels of corn. This year, 1.5 billion bushels. And also look at Brazil, what's going down there with their, their production. 10 years ago on corn, 3.2 billion bushels, now 4.6 billion. We've got Ukraine, we've got uh, Brazil, we've got uh, Romania, we've got these Pakistan, these countries coming in, increasing production, improving their quality of product and competing in that export market. Yeah, you know, soybean has been just humming along just great, but has there been any changes at all with soybean? Well, the, just the normal changes, again, increased production in Brazil 10 years ago, 3 billion, now 5.3 billion bushels of, of corn. You've got China coming in the bean market, and their, their demand for beans has increased dramatically. And China, how can you read what's going on in China? I think we can anticipate the increased production, but getting a handle on the, on the demand is going to be difficult. And finally, cotton. What's going on with cotton where, you know, it's it's going to be fall soon and so harvest is going to be right around the corner so what's going on with cotton well cotton is relatively stable right now now it is a profitable commodity produced and when you got profit in a commodity there will be changes because producers around the world they'll see where the profit is they'll determine where the profit is and they will increase the production and take the profit out of it so cotton's in a good in good position right now i don't see any changes quickly but over time we'll see some changes in cotton you always got to keep watching the markets that's right all right thanks kim kim anderson grain marketing specialist here at oklahoma state university good morning oklahoma welcome to cow calf corner on sun up this week we're going to talk about mineral nutrition and specifically probably mineral nutrition relative to cow herds and stalker calves. We are joined by Dr. Paul Beck. Paul, what's the importance of getting the right mineral out? Well, there's a, there's a lot of different things that go into mineral nutrition. It's a complex, there's a whole lot of different minerals that you know, are essential to cows and, they have a, and, and calves and they have a lot of different roles uh, in metabolism and in body functions and all that. So it's extremely important, but it's really variable on, you know, soil types, forage types, and, and then the specific animals that, that we're using with it, whether it's cows and calves versus stalker cattle. So there's different nutritional requirements depending on what stage of production, and, and there's just a lot that goes into it. Um, so it's really not one size fits all uh, when we're talking about minerals for cattle on pasture. When we're looking at a cow that's producing a lot of milk uh, and then going into breeding, uh, looking at phosphorus, zinc, and copper, and cobalt, you know, if we have a deficiency in those, we can hurt reproduction. And so, you know, it's real hard to pick up. That's one of the first deficiency symptoms that we'll have. For stalker cattle or for growing calves, 
you know, zinc and copper are, are important in immune function. Uh, and calcium can really impact growth. If we have a real high phosphorus byproduct supplement type feed that we're utilizing, uh, we'd better add some calcium to that diet because we can really decrease growth if we're uh, uh, calcium deficient. What else relative to like summer plans? The type of forage that we're grazing is going to be important as we think about that right mineral and whether we're running growing calves versus a cow-calf operation is going to be important. What else do producers need to be looking at, Paul? <clears throat> a lot of our minerals are designed to be fed at uh, three or four ounces per head per day. Um, other minerals with higher mineral mixtures with higher concentrations of minerals might be designed for two ounce per day consumption. So we need to look at that in relation in, in cost of that mineral and make sure that the cattle are consuming what we're really aiming, uh, what the targeted consumption is for that mineral and have it available all the time. Another thing to think of, a lot, it's really popular for us to, to use a trace mineralized salt. It's mostly salt, but it does have some copper and zinc and others, but it's not high enough in those trace minerals. And those trace minerals are not usually digested well enough or utilized by the cattle well enough for that to be an effective mineral supplement. So we really need to look at using a mineral mixture designed for the operation we're using for those animals. Uh, native range on cow-calf, we're looking at a 12-12-12 type mineral, 12 salt, 12 calcium, and 12 phosphorus. That's going to be a lot more expensive than a stalker type mineral that could have a lower phosphorus requirement. Uh, when we're in eastern Oklahoma, well-managed Bermuda grass, we can feed a 12% calcium, you know, high salt mineral that has a lower phosphorus. You know, there's mineral mixtures out there that have three or four or 5% phosphorus and they will be a cheaper mineral uh, and we can effectively use those on those introduced pastures. Paul, thanks for joining us on Cow-Calf Corner again this week and thanks to you all for being with us. And that about wraps it up for us today. Now, if you saw something you liked on the show, you can go on our website, sunup.okstate.edu and follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Curtis Sayer, and we'll see you next weekend bright and early at sunup.